Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the curator of public programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. As a land grant institution, UCLA acknowledges the Gabriolino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of the Los Angeles Basin Southern Channel Islands and are grateful to have the opportunity to work for the indigenous peoples in this place. We pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and our relatives past, present, and emerging. The Fowler is very pleased to present today's program as part of our Disrupt the Fowler series. Disrupt is a UCLA student design organization that aims to establish inclusive spaces and provide opportunities for students of all backgrounds to engage in creative collaborations. The Fowler is honored to partner with Disrupt and offer programs that break down barriers in the art world and promote innovative ideation through inclusivity, diversity, equity, and accessibility. President and co-founder of Disrupt, Gustavo Tepetla, will be representing Disrupt today. We are very honored to be joined by Esteban Oriol, a worldwide disruptor in photography, the subject and director of the Netflix documentary, LA Originals. He captures both the glamor of Hollywood celebrities and the uncut reality of inner cities. Oriol reveals the true essence of his subjects in an unapologetic approach to photographic truth. During his conversation with Gustavo, we'll look back at some of his most famous images, including those of Ryan Gosling and Snoop Dogg, among others. If you have any questions during this program, we encourage you to submit them through the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can submit and upvote questions that you'd like to hear answered at the end of the program. In order to see both of our guests during the visual presentation, once the screen sharing begins, I encourage you to click View Options and then select side-by-side -side mode, which will allow you to see both guests simultaneously during the presentation. Okay, that's enough from me. Over to you, Esteban and Gustavo. There we are, hello. Hey, what's up, Esteban? How are you, brother? Good, how are you? I'm good, thanks for asking. Uh, once again, welcome uh, for joining us today on this uh, Disrupt the Fowler series. Um, just wanted to say again, you know, big thank you for uh, coming through for us. Um, and so I just wanted to ask you uh, right now, I guess we'll just jump right into it, right? Yeah, let's um, do it. Well, I, I first wanted to ask you real quick before, before we even jump into it, uh, I want to ask you uh, real quick, who were your major influences and uh, when were you first uh, getting started? Like wh what started it? What got you behind the camera? Uh, my dad, Eriberto Orio, he was my first uh, influence as far as, um, you know, he got me into it. He handed me an a extra camera that him and his wife had. And at that time, he wasn't really pushing photography. He was getting more into painting. So he was like, uh, hey, man, you know, you're living a pretty cool lifestyle. You're in East L.A., you know, all the time uh, with your lowrider club, you know, doing the lowriding thing. And then you're traveling with House of Pain because at that time I was a tour manager of House of Pain and um, he was like, you live a pretty cool lifestyle. You're traveling around the world and then you're east, low riding East LA all the time and you know, it'd be cool to document that. So I started doing it little by little and I got a little bit, uh, at first I was a little intimidated to bring out a camera because at that time it wasn't cool to carry around a camera especially to, uh, you know, put up, pull it out and put in people's faces and take pictures of them. So it was a really rare thing, not unlike today, you know, where you see people, you drive by and you see people talking to themselves and taking selfies and doing TikTok videos on the side of the road and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. So, you know, it's, it's completely the opposite of what it used to be. So at that time it was kind of a, you know, you, you kind of had to, uh, break it in you kind of had to smooth people over you know you weren't really uh you know just walked around the only people that i knew that had cameras were like paparazzis uh professionals and tourists and you could see any of those a mile away you know the professional guys had a guy with a a gold or silver thing you know changing the light for them or they had like you know all different kinds of lights and equipment and the paparazzis were just, you know, stocking celebrities and tourists, you know, had a camera with a strap and they had, you know, a straw hat on and they're walking around with black socks and, you know, huaraches or whatever. Right. And uh, you can just see them a mile away. So 
at first it was a little bit hard for me, but I got I got more comfortable by using it with my people, you know, by using it with the uh, people that I was low riding with all the time or by taking, a, you know, with House of Pain uh, touring. And then like other people that we'd go on tour with, I would, you know, become comfortable with them and friendly enough to where I could just bust out the camera and take pictures. But, you know, at first it wasn't easy. Let, let me ask you something, Esteban. Uh, if we can go back to the Ellie Fingers photo for a second. Sure. This is such an iconic photograph. Can you can you tell us like more in depth like where was this photo taken, um, and all, like it's L.A. What does Los Angeles mean to you? Uh, L.A. is my is my home. You know, it's it runs through my through my veins. I take it with me everywhere I go. I wave the flag everywhere I go, and uh, you know I'm all about L.A. All 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 three of my books that you've that I put out was L.A. Woman, L.A. Portraits, and there's Los Angeles. And all my merch is, you know, everything LA from this Los Angeles to the LA hand shirt to the outline of it, the LA fingers to, the, you know, I put the this Los Angeles, like the one you're wearing, I put that on some shirts, you know, to help promote the book. So everything that I do is about LA or in LA. And um, this photo, I, I took it. Um, in 1994 around and then I started uh, showing it to people around 1995 and I took it of a, a you know female LA gang member and I was shooting uh, some just photographs of her from a uh, from a distance and then I, I saw the the hands you know going up and I and I was like man that kind of looks cool and I went in and took like a, a close-up shot of it and at that time I was shooting mostly um, photos of, of, of a person and their environment. So you wouldn't really, I wasn't really shooting details. And I, I started uh, submitting my pictures to magazines. When they would do an interview, they'd say, hey, do you, can you send us your 10 best photos or your 10 favorite photos? And I would send them photos. And then I started noticing that they all kind of looked like the similar style you know a guy like you know you know sitting on his porch but you could see like the whole front of his house or somebody standing in front of a liquor store and you could see the whole liquor store or you know different things like that and i was like man let me just change it up a little bit and send him some some type of detail shots so i'd send him like a shot of just a date and rim you know some low riding uh just the fingers and some female or some gang members or something like that and I started noticing that the magazines were picking it up and using that as the the first or biggest presentation of the interview. So they would either use it in the, the very first page of the interview or they would ask me if they could put it on the cover. And um, it started, you know, going further and further. And I, I started noticing the the reaction was getting bigger and bigger and, and better and better to that photo. So I just started being, you know what, I'm just going to keep pushing it. And I've just been pushing that image for, uh, let's see, my math is so good. How about yours? 26 years? 1994, I think. Yeah. Um, I just been, this whole time, I've been pushing that image all around the world and for the whole time. And I trip out when I see, uh, you know, people biting it or copying it. Cause you know, me and you grew up in a different era where it was all about origi originality and everybody had their own style and did their own thing. But now everything's, you know, flipped and gone the opposite direction, just like a lot of other things. And people, think it's cool to just bite something and flip it up a little bit and and uh, and say like, oh, well, you know, I put the fingernails red, so, you know, it's not yours anymore. I, I added my own thing to it. I'm like, what are you talking about, man? Are you lost your mind? <laughs> right, right. Anyways, I, I, I trip out on it and it gets me hot. And uh, at the same, you know, they say like, I don't know who said it, but I don't know how they came up with it, but they say like 
uh, imitation is the best form of flattery. But I don't think that person got imitated and copied as much as I did, you know? Right. To the point where it's not flattering no more. It doesn't, it's not cool if H&M is making, you know, 100,000 shirts and making all the money and I don't get nothing out of it if they just put different ring, rings on the finger or something like that. Like to me, that's not a, it's not flattering at all. So it's been a blessing and a curse. It's definitely opened a lot of doors for me and it's made uh, some decent money for me. And I've been able to um, kind of like survive through these times when I can't take pictures or do it. Well, I can, but I mean, not for work. Right. Uh, you know, I can't, my, my job is to take pictures of people and now I can't be around people. So I don't know how I'm supposed to do my job, you know? So I'm not really into um, shooting like products or any type of stuff like that. So, you know, it's kind of put like a monkey wrench in my, in my program, but what I have done is been able to sell some merch and do some collaborations with big companies that um, I've been able to use their platform. They use my platform and we get, you know, we get some, some merch out there to the world and some cool collaborations. I've done some good stuff with Born and Raised, Fool's Gone Wild, um, Cholo Fit Creeper and uh, Burner at uh, Cookies. And that's that's pretty much what's carried me through this pandemic because I wasn't I didn't qualify for the 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 loans and I didn't get my uh, money from Donald Trump or none of that stuff. So luckily, I was able to put some pi pictures on a shirt and uh, people bought them and right bought some of my books and man, thank, you know I'm very thankful for that for people that appreciate my work and support me like that. Yeah, we do. We, we we actually in the community, as you already know, you're you're valued, you know, you're a legend when you walk through Los Angeles or, or just about any anywhere globally. Um, I've had the privilege of, of uh, traveling uh, to Europe with you. Um, so I see it everywhere we've gone. I mean, the amount of respect and admiration that people show you is amazing, but it all stems back to the hard work, right? Your hard work ethic. Uh, nobody really, you know, nobody gave you anything. You basically, uh, you earned it and you made it happen, um, which actually takes me to this conversation, right? This next conversation, which is um, you're able to get into all of these spaces, right? Um, it's not like you're, you know, doing it the, uh, I guess, the formal way, which is to like pull a permit and, and try to gain access to a certain location and, you know, block off the entire neighborhood just to get uh, one or two shots in. Uh, you actually have access to so much, uh, whether it, it's uh, the street or uh, Hollywood celebrities and whatnot. Like, like, what gives you that access? Like, how are you able to get into these spaces? Um, I would just say, you know, the respect that I give people. You know, I, I'm I'm cool with everybody. I don't I'm neutral. You know, I don't have no enemies. I might have a couple, but I'm uh, respectful with everybody. You know, the only people that I that I have any issues with are people that are like, you know, what they call jealous or haters, but I've never done nobody dirty. I never done nobody wrong. So nobody could come at me like that. You know, it's basically just off of something that they felt some certain, certain type of way, but, um, you know, I'm everywhere I've gone. I've never had a problem going there. I've, I've always been, um, respectful and treated with respect and I've always, uh, you know, and I've always carried myself the right way because I've never had a problem. People always ask me, you know, how do you do that? I'm like, I don't even know. I'm like, I couldn't tell you how I do it, but I just know what I do and what I don't do. And, you know, what I do is respect every everybody and everywhere I go. And, and that's what, you know, that's what keeps everything, you know, cool. Like, I can pretty much go everywhere I've gone again and do the same thing unless the person doesn't isn't there no more like my go-to person that I that I know and I kick it with when I'm there right I've noticed that too like everywhere we have uh well where we have gone together uh during travels 
um, I've noticed that about you. You're very mindful, but you're also really aware of your situation. Like you have a lot of situational awareness. You're aware of everything going on at the same time. So yeah, like I watch people all the time and, and I'm like, Hey, watch check. like the other day we were out, out with the, with the, at the Dodger, um, the day the Dodgers won, we, we hit the streets. And we were in this one place and I seen these two guys like talking and arguing and it looked like it had had um, it looked like it had been solved and then the the one of the groups of guys came back and this one guy was walking really funny you know he had like a like a weird limp and I was like man I, I told my friend I was, first I watched that guy and I seen what he was doing he was looking for that group of guys the other group of guys and I was like, oh man. And then I, then I scanned the crowd, I looked for them, and I, they weren't there no more. And then I see more guys coming up to this guy that had the limp. And I was like, this is a trip, man. I go, these, these guys came back to get those other guys. And he's not limping from an injury. He's got something tucked in his pants that made his, his leg walk straight. Like maybe some type of a rifle or shotgun or something. And I was tripping out because, you know, we're out in the middle of the street. It was dark. There was a lot of people out there. It was like there was no cops anywhere. And it could have got real ugly if both of those groups met up again with each other. But luckily that one had left by the time those guys came back. And I had told my friends, I was like, hey, man, look at the way that fool's walking right there. Right. Like, what? You're already aware. Yeah, they're like, what do you think's wrong with him, Michael? He's got a strap, and he came back to get those other dudes, and he's like, they're like, oh, 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 how do you, how do you, how do you see all that? How do you figure all that out? And because I'm watching, fool, well, you know, we're out here in the street. There ain't no, you know, we're there's a couple hundred people out here. There's right. nothing was gonna happen, you know. People are going buck wild in these times, so you got to stay on your p's and q's and stay on your toes and open those little eyes in the back of your head and and. Uh, you know, stay alert, stay woke. Let me ask you about this image here, Esteban. Um, for those that y'all don't know who it is, uh, it's 50 Cent. Um, you can see him on Power. I, he's on a show named Power. I mean, he's had music career, um, vitamin water. I mean, you name it. Um, and again, it's like you're always around. Uh, you're like magnetic, like people are drawn to you and you're able to take these images. Can, can you tell us more about this image here? Yeah, this was the day that um, 50 Cent came to our warehouse. Um, this is where we used to have Joker clothing. And we had our, our art department upstairs and the office. Our partners had the office upstairs. And then there was like the, the people that ran the warehouse. Like to the left of him is the warehouse. And this was like the actual entranceway to the to our warehouse. So like usually people would have this as like a little uh, desk with a secretary and all that. And the person would come in and you greet them and then you either send them in the warehouse or send them upstairs to the to the offices. But we didn't have secretaries or any of that. So we ended up making this uh, cartoons tattoo shop. And that was one of the first uh, places that he tattooed you having a private studio because at first we were doing it in our in our loft downtown. And then we, we moved to this warehouse with these uh, new partners that we got for Joker and ended up uh, making that the tattoo area. And a lot of people came through there and got tattooed. Um, Nas got tattooed there, Travis from uh, Blink-182. Of course, uh, you know, 50 and all his crew, the whole G unit crew. Um, I mean, it was it was endless, the, the amount of people that came through that one. And uh, that was that was right in the middle when he was signing the deal with Jimmy Iovine to oh, do nice. his first album. He had to leave that day or the day before. One of the days Cartoon did the outline of the 50 on his back. And he had to leave and go have a meeting with Jimmy Iovine, and then he had to come back the next day and do do the inside. Right to feel, get the feelings. Yeah, uh, what? that that was one of those two days. I'm seeing this image here. Can can you let us know more about this? I mean, you have like 
LA legends here, you know? Yeah, this is one of my, this is one of my favorite uh, shoot days. This was the first day that I got to shoot Snoop Dogg. And I, I was, me and B-Real were, we're still super tight. We're like brothers, but back then we kicked it together on a daily basis. And um, I told me, I gotta go shoot Snoop Dogg for the cover story. And, and it's like cover and 10 pages on the inside. He's at this place, Encore, you should roll with me. He goes, yeah, let's do it. Because I always just try to like hook up my friends and hook up people together. So I'm thinking like, if I go there, if I roll with, with Be Real, it's going to be a good look for me with Snoop. And two, who knows, Snoop and B might, you know, fire up a joint and, and end up doing a song together. So when we got there, I, I at that time, me and Be Real, we co-owned Joker brand clothing together. And I told him, hey, let's, let's take a box for Snoop. So hold on, this cart's going by outside the office. You hear it? Yeah. Sounds like he has metal wheels. <laughs> um, so that day, uh, we went to Encore Studios in Burbank, and I took Snoop a box of clothes, and I was like, "Hey, hey, Snoop, here's a here's a gift from me and uh, Be Real. We have a clothing company called Joker." He's like, "Oh man, that's cool." He's like, can I wear some for the photo shoot? I go, hell yeah. So he put on, we had East Sider, West Sider, and South Sider sweatshirts, and he threw on the East Sider. And then um, I took him outside to the to the alley because, you know, I didn't want to shoot him inside in the, in the um, that's another shot, that one of Eminem, that's at the same place a couple years later. But I, I didn't want to shoot him in the studio for 10 pages in a cover shot. So I took him outside. And I found this one guy's yard. We we're in the alley and it said, beware of dog. And I shot him there. This one there, perfect. And so I shot him right there. I don't know why I was just like, man, this is like, this is a, a cool spot for us. So I just framed it up and, you know, I think that, that ended up running pretty big in the magazine. And uh, we walked around in the alley and I, I did the whole photo shoot there, but it was cool when we got there, you know, to see um, Nate Dog rest in peace and Snoop playing the the video games. Um, Daz Dillinger was there, Dre was there, and you know, like that's all West Coast heavy hitters right there. You know, like it doesn't yeah, get get any better than that. I was going to ask you too, uh, like looking at that Eminem photo. We can go back to Eminem, um, and then uh, just. I've noticed like too, like in all your work, you're able to capture uh, like the, the essence of, of the of your subject, you know, you always have this look like you just know how to capture like that time. Like what? How do you know when to snap that photo? Like how to capture that? I think a lot of photographers would love to know. I'm not saying give away your secrets. Yeah, I, I just, um, like when those guys were playing. The, the video game, I just walked behind the TV and I just shot them, you know, I was like, hey, is it cool with you guys if I take a, a couple of pictures? And they're like, yeah, go for it, man. I go, just do your thing. I'm not, you know, you don't gotta look at me or nothing. Just do, you know, do what you're doing. And so I just, I just hung back for a minute and let them start talking again. So it didn't feel uncomfortable and let them, you know, get back to playing the game. And then I walked behind the TV and I took a shot of them and, you know, as you can see, like Be Real look, was looking at me and so did uh, Daz and the rest of them were doing their thing. But then this day when I when I went back there, Dre and uh, Eminem were doing this, doing work at, at the same uh, studio. And I went around the other side of the board, like behind where the, because all the boards at uh, professional studios, they, they always had like two speakers, like on the shelf on top of the, the board where all the gauges are and i just went in between those two speakers and and shot that shot because as you can see there's no lighting anywhere in there and i never really take lights i'm not a, the setup light kind of guy i just shoot with natural light or available light so on this day you know i didn't have no lights with me and and uh I was like, fuck, man, I really need to take a picture of Eminem. How, how, do I, how do I do this? And I went in the studio and there was like one light shining bright down on the board so that the, the engineer could see. 
and Eminem was sitting back like this and he was writing and rapping. I was like, hey, Em, is it cool if I get a shot of you? You know, he goes, yeah, what, what do you want me to do? I go, can you kind of lean up to the, so that the light's hitting you? He, he was like, yeah, for sure. He leaned up, I took a couple shots and I was gone, you know? That, but I think that I, I got some good, like if you see the sheet that that came on, cause back in the day when you shot film, it came out on uh, like on, on the out on stuff like this yeah your contact yeah they call it a contact sheet or a proof sheet so you could proof the the lighting and stuff so if you look at the contact sheet with eminem there's only like two of these strips with him then there's like two strips of a day i was doing low riding and then there was like maybe like my daughter or something playing in the yard or whatever so back in the day that's how we used to shoot like you didn't overshoot you just shoot a couple pictures here and there and you get what you like and boom it's gone it's over because all these cost a lot of money each one of these is 25 bucks and i have five hundred thousand photos on here there's three there's 36 so in my file cabinets here i got over five hundred thousand photos shot on negative and then i have a, a 96 terabyte drive that's full of it has 80 terabytes of video and digital photos so you know back in the day the, the way you learn is by spending money so you weren't out there there's a new not new but since digital era has come there's a technique that people do is called spray and pray and what they do is they just hold their finger down the button and it just goes so they can just take like a thousand pictures and anybody in the world, even if you didn't, uh, if you couldn't see, if you hold your finger down on that button long enough, you're going to get a good shot sooner or later it's, it's going to happen. So, but with, when you were spending money on it, you took your time and you really thought things out before you just keep flicking. Cause we didn't have a delete button and we didn't have a screen back then that you could see when you got a good shot. So, when you click that button, you are making sure that you had the perfect shot that you like in there. Yeah, I noticed that too. Like when I was looking at the contact sheet that you just showed with, uh, shared with us, yeah. uh, I was noticing you're only taking like five, maybe 10 shots max. Yeah, and like getting you see this right here? This was a day I went to a Trump rally in Beverly Hills because during this, during this time, well, I'll just show you real quick. So you can see this was a these these three and a half were a Trump rally or two and a half and this half and this one were um, were my forty seven fleet line and then these two strips were some mariachis in East LA so that that's that's how, should, that's how all my proof sheets look for the most part. Yeah, that ties in too to like how you're able to go into so many spaces because even looking at your photography i mean you're you're doing like uh la street uh heads you know you have uh celebrities as far as like, like you know actors actresses but you also have recording artists and uh for example the booyah tribe right like yeah. i remember growing up in booyah tribe as a, a like doing you know popping and locking at shows you know and then also uh rapping as well yeah um and again, these are all different like neighborhoods, different areas. So like the fact that you're able to get into so many spaces is like, um, it's uh, how can I say it, man? It's like a, an admired trait, for, especially for a photographer to be able to get into all of the spaces. Yeah, it, it's been cool, man. It's been, I, I've, and, and like the trip about it is, is that I've been to 56 countries. So I've been to a lot of different cities in, and it happens the same way everywhere I go. Like I just end up meeting cool people and I go and do some, you know, cool photo shoots and people are like, how do you get that? How do you do that? I'm like, I don't, I, I really don't know. I just meet cool people and they're like, hey, you want to go over here? You want to go over there? And I go to a spot. I'm like, hey, is it cool to take pictures here? They go, yeah, go ahead. And then too, what I noticed too is like, again, it's like how I had met mentioned how you're able to just capture something within like a couple of photographs, right? Yeah. Like highlighting the fact that the photos that you're taking, 
end up being like fronts of uh, magazines or like complete folds uh, within magazines uh, or, or spreadsheets or using their campaigns. Like, I mean, all the photos like DJ Quick, I've seen that photo uh, when he was in the studio so many times. I've seen Ice Cube's photo. I've seen this photo. I mean, like uh, every yeah. photo is just epic. This one ended up being um, a poster that they sold. And um, they also sold, like uh, my friend Skinhead Rob, he was in a band called The Transplants, which was with Travis and Tim from Rancid. And uh, from that, I met Travis, and then I got into the Blink-182 camp. But just for The Transplants alone, we, me and Cartoon, we designed, did the logos, and shot photos for uh, two of the Transplant album covers. Then I did a three videos for the transplants. And then I, I went into the Blink-182 camp and we did, uh, I would say two or three album covers with them, album packagings where we designed it and everything. And then I did uh, multiple photo shoots. I, uh, we, we designed a, uh, a program for, for when you go to the concert, it's like a little booklet that has all photos of the band and that was in this and then also uh i sold them some of my photos for t-shirts and ended up doing a a little documentary of them on tour in uh europe as well as six music videos for them but just from meeting skinhead rob i got into the transplant camp then i got into the blink 182 camp and with you know, tra uh, Tim Armstrong being in the transplants, I got into the Rancid camp and did some photos and some work with them. So it's yep. really important to, you know, your, your relationships with the people that you meet that, you know, I mean, you could meet somebody like a skinhead Rob that could just take you into, you know, all these type of places and, and, you know, like those, those, Three camps did a lot for my my career as a photographer, you know, because it's completely different types of music that I was used to. I was in the hip hop world, and then I got into like the punk, um, kind of like rock pop scene, you know, with with shooting all those guys. So, I mean, that was, that was a a great thing, you know, for me. I was going to ask you too because you were you were already building on it, uh, but that was actually going to be my my next question was like. How are you able um, to navigate all these different um, like ventures you've taken on? I mean, you've had a clothing brand. Uh, I remember I went to the last laugh. So there was a shop, uh, tattoo shops. I mean, there's just so much in the campaigning um, campaigns for uh, movies with uh, epic actors, you know, like Al Pacino, De Niro um, campaigns or, or collaborations with uh, Ford, uh, with with so much, I mean, you're, you're all, you're everywhere, you know? Uh, so how are you able to do that? I mean, uh, people just, you know, hit us up and, and we either say, yeah, or no, you know, like, uh, we, we, we do a lot of cool stuff with brands. Um, some of it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's those fine lines where you like, you're not down really with the, with the brand but you want to do the work or you want the work and and also you have 20 people you know under you like 20 employees that you're you're responsible to bring in work to feed all those families which is you know it's kind of a big responsibility and you're not thinking about it at the time but I mean, things just start taking off and the, the ball starts rolling. And you're like, you end up like, I remember looking one day we, I, I went into work and, and I was the actual partner in the company, which meant I was the boss and we had 20 people working for us, 20 or 30. And I, and I kind of tripped out. I was like, Whoa, you know, like I got 30 employees working for my company. Like, and I'm, it's, it's my company. I'm one of the owners. And I kind of tripped out, like, like, you know, just in seconds in my head going like, damn, like if something happened to our company, like all these people's families would be asked out, you know, they, they wouldn't have that security and everything. And, 
and it, and it tripped me out, you know, and I was like, you, you know, sometimes we're like, you know, a job would come in, they're like, hey, we got this job for so-and-so, and I was like, what, what do you mean? And they're like, yeah, we, we got a job with this brand, isn't that great? I was like, what's so great about it? And they're like, well, you know, it's good money. And I'd be like, yeah, but you know, man, I'm not, I'm not really down with that brand, you know, it's like kind of corny or it's not healthy or it's not this or that, and they're like, hey, we got 30 employees, we got bills to pay, you know, we got lights to turn on, like, you know, sometimes you just gotta, gotta, you know, swallow your pride and go with the flow. And I was like, wow, you know, that's a trip, you know, but it, it was real, you know, like we had all them people and, and it, it came to an end. It came to a point where that company, you know, every, we closed the doors and all them people were, you know, kind of like on their own. They're like back to, well, I don't have a job because of the, the, that company closed down. I was like, well, that's when the, the, they, they say the, you know, the shit gets real, you know, when, when your whole life has to change and go on another drastic, you know, a drastic turn in your life. And you're like, whoa, you know, cause that stuff makes you pump your brakes and, and really realize like, you know, all these times where you're looking at these great photos and you're like, you know, man, those were good times, but you know, right now is not such a good time. And then you though like you looking back on those good times kind of pushes you through those times to where you're like, you know what, I've done some great things and I'm not, you know, maybe right now is a, is a, a bump in the road, but I'm going to get, get back to doing those great things and I'm going to push through this and get back on the other side. There's like a lot of responsibility, right? When it comes to yeah. having brands and, and, and taking care of people and providing opportunity. And so that leads me to my next question, right? Which is, uh, what advice would you offer to any aspiring photographer that's interested in like following your footsteps? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people, um, you know, within our communities that look up to you. They want to, they want to be like you. Um, cause again, it's like that, that form of flattery, right? Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, to me, it's hard to say what I could tell somebody to do because like you said earlier, I didn't do it the traditional way, you know, like when I started doing photography, I didn't go to school or class or I didn't see nobody that was out there really pushing the line or, you know, like there were people doing what I was doing before me. And there's been a lot of people doing what I do after me. But I just think that I moved and navigated through it a little bit differently. Like, uh, I don't, I don't know if people could do it the way that I did it. So if I'm telling somebody, Hey, do it like this, like, I don't know if you could do it that way because maybe that way isn't possible anymore. Like when I started, I was like, working as a tour manager of a band and I was in a lowrider club. So for me shooting lowriders, I didn't have a camera and go, Hey, I want to go shoot lowriders. I was low I had a car, I had a lowrider first. And then I would take my camera with me to different things we do. And I start shooting lowriders. Then I was on tour. I was a tour manager. That was my job. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to go to Paris and, and this place and that place, Japan, I'm going to take some pictures and, you know, come back and show my friends back here. So we'd go to Japan and I'd be, you know, as soon as we hit the ground, me and Muggs would be like, hey man, let's go check out the city. So me and Muggs would go and I'd be like, hey, let's, let's, uh, let's go to the Eiffel Tower, homie. And, you know, and I'd take a picture of him in front of the Eiffel Tower just to show that we, were re we had really been to France and shit like that. So <laughs> it's harder to say like, oh, go, you know, or people see pictures of me, me that I've done with gangsters and stuff like that. And, you know, they're like, well, you know, I couldn't really tell somebody, yeah, just go down to this neighborhood or go down to that neighborhood and, you know, start shooting pictures, you know, because, you know, that's not good advice, you know. Yep. That leads me to my next question for you, Esteban. Um, the fact that nobody can really duplicate you, right, or replicate you, your work or your work ethic is because you are an L.A. original. And so that leads me to the next question, which is, uh, you know, can you let us in a little bit? Uh, Give us a little bit of insight on that Netflix documentary that you have right now, currently playing uh, LA Originals. Yeah, that was a that was three hundred hours of uh, footage that I had throughout the years, through like twenty five years, and 
I had first shopped it around in the early 2000s. It was called Ink. If people like go on to YouTube and they look up Ink the trailer uh, with cartoon, that was the first version of it. And that's what we were shopping around to like different movie companies and stuff. And we had gotten a deal to do a, uh, to, we got a deal with Brian Grazer and Ron Meyer, who was a uh, head of Universal at that time. And they were like, we don't want to do the documentary, but we want to do a feature. But that would mean that you can't do the documentary and the documentary would have to get shelved until after the movie came out. So the movie didn't come out for like 10 years. And it had gone through different names and went through a big roller coaster. And it ended out ended up becoming a movie called Lowriders. And me and Cartoon were executive producers and uh, consultants on it. And at that time, uh, you know, it, it went, it went different, so many different turns at the end. We were just like, okay, we're, we're happy to do this. Let's, let's get it. Let's get it done. Let's get it out. So we went and got all our friends to get in the, you know, be in the movie, went and got a bunch of friends, you know, to have their cars in the movie and, you know, we just connected as many people as we could and, uh, but, you know, as much of the most authentic and the right stuff in the movie and uh, it came out, it did pretty good. And then a couple years later, we got the footage back. They, they gave us the rights to everything back. And I met a guy in uh, Argentina who's a producer down there. His name's Sebastian Ortega. And he's the only guy in, the, in Argentina to have a lowrider. And he was a movie executive. He owned his own company. And he had a, uh, he's a, he wears like Chuck Taylor's Dickies and white t-shirts and he's, he's sleeved down covered in tattoos. So for, for me, when I started talking to him about low riding and stuff and I'm looking at him, I'm like, this guy gets it, you know, this is somebody that understands the, the culture and he likes the culture. And it's not like a square guy that sees something and is like, oh, I want to do something on that. That looks cool. Like. This guy has like low riders, he's covered in tattoos, he dresses the same way we do, and he's he has a high position as a high executive in a big company. So we're like, man, if anybody gets it in this world, it's him. And he signed us up and just I, I went down to Argentina and took all my footage down there. And he he put in his company. Got a couple of editors on it and they just started going and they're because you know I couldn't be there every day like I like I am up here in, in uh, LA with the videos and the different stuff that I direct you know I can go pop in on the editors but because I was in Argentina you know we had to do it all through the internet and um, you know I had to trust them I had a good team down there of a producer and, so, and a writer and some editors that you know they they were working on it every day and they would send me clips, you know, through WeTransfer or whatever, Vim, or, uh, Vimeo and all that stuff. So I was like, okay, yeah, you know, can you take this shot out? Can you put this in there? And it, it was pretty much a nightmare. And uh, it was hard to do, you know, it was, it was, uh, it took two years of editing. So for, you know, for most of people, it probably looks easy, you know, they probably think like, oh yeah, they, they had the footage, all they had to do is get some, give it to an intern or, or something like that, an editor, and he could pop it together real quick and slap it together and throw it up on Netflix. And But it was a lot of hard work and more thousands of hours, you know, of work. And uh, they ended up showing it to they had previous stuff on Netflix, Latino down in Argentina, and they showed it to those guys. And those guys showed it to the Netflix headquarters here in the States. And they were like, okay, cool. Yeah, we'll show it, you know, but we couldn't get our own deal up here at Netflix. So it was kind of cool that we went through Sebastian, you know, and then he put it through his connection in South and uh, Netflix in South America. And then it, they got it up to here to the States and then we finally got it out, but it wasn't easy. And, you know, of course, one more time we had to go outside of LA to, to get our love and um, it worked out 
you know, perfect. It worked out incredible. Like we were really bummed out, you know, we were, we were set up to do a bunch of film festivals, which is where you want to be as a film director is, you know, that's with your peers and that's where you get the respect as a filmmaker is in film festivals. You know, um, it's not like you can just throw it up. Anybody can be a film person now. You could just make a movie and throw it up on YouTube and, you know, call yourself a director, but it seems like you don't get the respect that you get until you enter the film festivals where it's only people in the movie industry. And Netflix is getting like that, you know, it's like that it's getting taken serious. You know, there's millions and millions of dollars in there. A lot of content is being made for there. And um, there's things like uh, the Irishman that was made for, I think it was Netflix, but they had to release it. Yeah, it was Netflix. They had to release it in a movie theater for a certain amount of time for it to be um, put up for Oscars, you know, for the awards. Because I, I guess the one of the rules was if it if it doesn't hit the theaters, then it's not it's not real. If it's just streaming, so they had to rent out a movie theater and uh, you know put it through there and and have people go to the movie theater and watch it, and then they were able to put it up for the awards. But it's a trip that, that you know that they had to go through that, even with Joe Pesci, you know Robert De Niro, Scorsese, and all them. I was going to ask. To, Stevan, uh, sorry, sorry to cut you, brother, because uh, we have to get into some quick uh, Q and A from uh, the audience members. They have a lot of questions for you, um, but I do want to say that I'm I'm happy and excited that you know LA Originals is on Netflix and it came out, and you know people are able to see your work, uh, cartoons work, and like just the entire family, you know, collaborating and putting everything together. Because um, I think it's important to be visible. Uh, so I'm going to start off with the first question uh, from Michael, uh, which is, uh, what camera would you recommend for a beginning photographer, film or digital? For me, I'd say film 100%. I got a can I use Canon A ones. They're cheap. They're on eBay from anywhere from 125 on up to 300. But I wouldn't go that high because sometimes they break and then you you feel like a sucker, you know. So. All right. Just get the, the ones in the hundred dollar range, and uh, if they're coming from Japan, which I've which I've noticed, they're immaculate. They're like somebody they somebody over there had a bunch of them in the boxes and put them away, and they're in like perfect condition. But I would say learn from the way that the craft started, then you could go on and use that knowledge when you get to the digital world. But, you know, because pretty much everybody knows how to use digital, right, you know, with the phone, you know, you hit the, you take the picture, you put in the filters, and you do your photo editing, and, you know, you make it to whatever you want, and it comes out great. That's pretty much a digital camera is just uh, another level of that. But if you take it back to the, to the old school, and you learn how to do film, then you learn more about the process and about the craft. So I would say... A, you know, scoop of a Canon A1 off eBay and start right there. Do you prefer a black and a white or color? I prefer black and white uh, more, 100% more. I feel that the photos look more classic. And um, I just I just like the way the black and white photos come out. But I use color, though. We have M&M fans in the house. So uh, what would... What does he like in person? This is from Kevin Webb in Thailand. Kevin, what's up? Uh, let me see. Eminem is probably one of the coolest um, people in the entertainment business that I worked with. He was always uh, he was always the same from day one when I met him to when we went to interview him for the documentary. Like he was always like uh, real friendly. You know, it was like, you know, like when I saw him, like every couple of years or whatever, you know, now I've known him since 1998 until 2018. So that's uh, 20 years. And when I saw him in 2018, it was like, you know, 
it was like, hey man, what's up? You know, it's just like good old times, you know, like with a when you with an old friend you haven't seen for years, but it, it felt like, you know, no time had passed. You know, you could just tell by looking at, you know, them that, yeah, man, we've been getting older, huh? You know. But he was always cool as hell. I mean, he's always been very supportive. He was the one guy. He was the the one person in the industry that put the link to the movie in his bio and he posted us, you know, like some people might have posted us or whatever, but he did the most. Like he was like, hey, go check out my homie's movie. That's check dope. out the link in the bio. He has the most followers out of everybody in the in the movie. So that was like to have the the biggest person in the movie put that much, you know, put us out there that much like that that says a lot you know so i mean that i can't say nothing bad about that guy ever uh joe uh actually i was there when he when you signed his book today <laughs> uh he's in the he's in the chat and he's asking um would you ever offer any workshops he's also thanking you for signing his book today yes sir thank you joe um i mean yeah i would do a workshop i just don't know if i'm really the the type of guy that is like teachable, you know, cause I get stuck kind of when I start thinking a million things and I, I've always felt like I'm, I'm not that good of a teacher. Like when it comes to, yeah, I guess just teaching people, you know, like I'm better just doing my thing. I'm better showing you than talking to you and telling you how to do stuff. You know, I could, like if you came up and said, hey, and you showed me your camera and you're like, hey, how can I get it to do this? I could just be, oh, you just put your camera like this and there you go, you know? That's kind of like how my dad taught me. He was like, hey, here's a camera. There's these two needles inside when you when you hold it up to your eye and the two needles, they when they line up, you're ready to shoot. So then just focus, you know, turn these two knobs and get the two needles to line up and then focus and, you know, hit the button when you're ready. And I was like, okay, that sounds easy enough. And that was my whole photography school. You know, as long as I took to say it, that's how fast he said it. And I was on my way. Yeah, but the next question question is, uh, what do you think it is about uh, L.A. that attracts uh, people so much to your work? Um, well, I think L.A. is just that place. You know, it's like there's cities in the world that are that are looked up to in in the world, in the whole world, you know, because of maybe because of TV and movies, you know, people, people always say like, oh yeah, I went to, you know, San Francisco or LA or New York and it was nothing like what I saw on TV or in the movies, you know, it was so much different, but, you know, for me, like, I think they just have heard or seen a lot of LA that they're, it's, it's, you know, it's one of the most famous and biggest and richest cities in the world. And I, what I mean by rich, I mean with so much different stuff, there's so much culture and there's so many things to do here. You know, there's like the beach is like 45 minutes to an hour away from the snow. You know, like there's not too many cities where you can go to the beach, you know, get some, uh, you know, go surfing, catch some waves at seven o'clock, six o'clock in the morning and then surf a couple hours and then drive up to Wrightwood and do some snowboarding. You know, there's not that many cities that you could do that kind of stuff. You know, now, you know? I was going to ask you, this is a, a, an important question from John B. Uh, John B is asking, uh, does Esteban have any programs or internships for troubled youth? I do know that I've seen you uh, do some uh, talks with troubled youth. Can you expand on that? Yeah, we've done a lot. Well, I've done a lot of, uh, me and my friends, we do a lot of outreaches for kids. Like, um, we've done everything from uh, the 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 highest level kids at art schools like Otis Parsons and Pasadena Art Center to the lifers group in the juvenile um, in the juvenile halls. So we've done everything from you know one end of the scale to the next where we go and we try to uh, do like I guess you'd call it motivational speaking or we tell our story. We've done that in um, in juvenile halls and prisons in um, homeless you know, homeless like type missions and then, um, you know, troubled youth, uh, troubled teens, schools or programs. We've, we've uh, one of the things when we did a, a me and Cartoon did a, a project with Nike is uh, 
they said, you're allowed, we have enough budgeted to do like 10 parties, 10 events for, um, you know, this release of, of shoes that you guys are doing. And we turned that budget into doing 45 um, events with troubled teens where we had different, uh, we, we had Nike use their, their buses to go pick up the kids at these, uh, you know, troubled teen centers and bring them down and we would do talks. We had a Nike Blue House and me and Cartoon had, um, had an exhibit there and we'd bring the kids down and we had food, Nike pay for food to, to cater them and give them like a pair of shoes and a t-shirt after when they leave. So they'd come down, get some game from me and Cartoon, get fed, get you know a pair of shoes and a shirt and then we'd send them home you know after seeing like all of the art and hearing our story and it it, it felt a lot better than if we would have had 10 parties where people are just coming and you know drinking wine eating cheese and saying how cool everything was you know so we've been doing all that kind of stuff for years uh we never really you know put it out there we didn't film it or take pictures of it really that much because that's not what we were doing it for. We weren't doing it for the likes. They didn't even have social media back then. We are just doing it from our heart and because we wanted to help people out. Thank you, Esteban. Thank you. Uh, thank you both so much, Esteban and Gustavo, for all of those awesome behind the scenes stories and real truths about you know the hard work that it takes to be a true disruptor. And we know how busy you are, Esteban. So thank you so much for giving us your time and energy today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yes. And thank you to everyone who joined us. This program has been recorded and will be available on our Instagram and on the Fowler website for you to revisit and share. And we hope that you'll join us again for our next program next month. Everyone have a great week. Thank you very much. Thank you. You too.